Thank you so much. Um, so my name is Guillermo Rauch. Uh, as I was introduced earlier today, the creator of Socket.io, I was involved very early on with the Node.js community, working on everything from trying to bring the core APIs to a point where they were useful to us at our first startup, all the way to creating new frameworks and uh, supporting existing frameworks. Uh, we worked with uh, some of the greatest uh, Node.js people like uh, TJ Halloway Chuck and Nate Rathledge, uh Marco Aurelio. And today I'm going to talk about something more um, encompassing, something more generic than just uh, Node.js, uh, specifically about real-time web applications and how I look at real-time web applications. Uh, when I was just thinking about the title of my talk earlier today, I started thinking about how we don't have a definition for it or how when we say real time, we all think maybe about different things. And some of you might think about WebSocket. Some of you might think about, uh, for example, data that refreshes over time, and maybe regardless of how we convey or move that data from different points. So I'll start by talking about a definition that I've come to after working with lots of different web applications. Uh, all the way before Node.js existed, through Comet, and all the things that we want to do with those technologies. So the first conclusion that I've come to is that when people think about real time, and they think about actually just moving data really fast. They think about refreshing data with minimal latency. So it's all about the user thinking that the data is not stale, that what they're looking at on the screen is a representation of the latest and greatest that's available on the server, and that that's coming with minimal latency. It's coming really fast after it gets to the server. So if you're chatting, someone sends a message, we want to get that message to someone else as fast as possible. And the other really important aspect is that that data to the user has to update automatically and uniformly. So automatically means uh, that they're not pressing a refresh button, for example, or they're not keeping track themselves of updating that data. And the other aspect of it is that if a portion of the screen that comes that's representing some data on the server updates, and then there's another reference to that data within the same application, both are, both are synchronized. So the data updates everywhere. And that all comes down to you write a web application that does never require that the user presses F5, for example. And what I like about this definition is that it's actually pretty easy to summarize it in two things, uh, despite all those long explanations. So your real-time application needs to be fast, and it needs to be self-updating. So I'll go with this definition for the uh, rest of this talk, and just to uh, put it in context of an example of uh, an application that you might write, I thought about a traditional uh, real-time application, which is a stock ticker showing uh, the value of a stock in real time. And I'll start with some simple HTML, we ha which has some representation on the user screen. And then we add some naive JavaScript to make sure that's up to date. Um, usually when we, uh, when we approach the problem like this, it's hard to decide on what timer we're going to set on the front end. Uh, this has been a long uh, subject of debate. For example, when you implement long polling is, how long does the polling duration need to be, or how fast do we need to try to get more data from the server? So we'll just go with 15 seconds right now. And then we assume that the server, at the start of this timeline, thinks that the price is 500. And disclaimer, I don't know what the price is. I just came up with this. Uh, so the user goes to the page. And then, of course, we're going to request uh, some JSON API. We're going to get that the price is uh, 500. And then we wait 15 seconds, which, of course, is completely arbitrary. At this point is where this application sort of breaks down and stops being as fast as it could be, because the price might have changed, but your front end will keep waiting. And see, it's Friday night, and it's really slow, and no one likes it. I don't like it, but we have to wait. Yeah. So, and then the front end decides to get it again, and then, boom, it updates to 505. The user at this point has no idea what the server uh, knew, and they, knew, they didn't know that it could have gotten faster. It's just your application just became slow. 
Um, so in this case, the front end is self-updating. So it, I think this is where a lot of people might be confused with, um, is my application real-time or not? Because if it's self-updating, you might think it's real-time. But in this case, it doesn't satisfy the other condition that we set. It's fast, and it's sad, and it makes me cry. <laughs> so uh, the next thing you might think is an optimization. You might think, oh, Guillermo, you said uh, 15 seconds. It could have been just immediate. So now, boom, it's fast and self-updating. So even though it's fast, or it might be fast, as I'll show next, uh, in fact, just because you're requesting data uh, from a client to the server, it's not as fast as it could be, because the server is really the source of truth of this data. So the server is the one that first finds out about the latest price, and technically is the one that should let the client know. The client doesn't need to ask. Um, but by performing this loop of get request, we also have a side effect that is, we increase latency by having to ask all the time, and then, of course, server resources. And the natural conclusion was that it's much better to have the server push data to us with, boom, socket.io. Let's see that again. Boom. <laughs> Beautiful, right? No. So you're like this at this point, but um, yeah, I actually uh, have come to the conclusion that Push is also not necessarily part of the definition of a real-time application. And I'd like to explain it with an analogy, which is you go, uh, and this is you. This is why it has a body. And you think you're hungry. And boom, idea. Let's go to Seven Dollar Coffee Cafe in Mission Dolores. So the analogy goes like this. You go and request the menu from the server. So this is the traditional, this is the way that I usually explain the traditional request response model. You just sit there, you get something, you get some response right away. So this uh, uh, wait, waiter is kind of weird, and he goes, 200 OK menu. And then he goes back to whatever he was doing. He idles. And this is what Node.js is good at. It's good at idling and handling all these request response cycles. And you're like, I know what I'm going to get. It's a bagel. <laughs> and in this case, there's no response. HTTP is a great protocol for modeling this. It's just, OK, I'll let someone know. The metaphor is really good. Then I find out that the kitchen is actually a web service. So the guy goes and goes, bagel, OK. OK, and then idles again. So this is where I think uh, the web sort of disappointed us, in which if we were expecting some update from someone else, it was usually really hard to do. And what we've been doing up until this point is always asking. So you become really upset, and you're like, what's the status? And then you incur in more load to the server because you need to check again. <laughs> <laughs> the kitchen gets really upset because they're like, dude, we're still working on it. And the guy is still pretty chill with his glasses, and he's OK. Um, and one second later, boom, here's you again, asking again. and this is. Kind of like our stock ticker example. You're like, yeah, I'll just ask again. There's no problem. But then what happens? There's other people that are interested in consuming this service. Uh, they all look like you, too. <laughs> and it results in server congestion. Uh, this is a single-threaded JVM, and it's really bad at handling uh, many things. So what's the solution? Of course, is that we push, client, we push updates to the client without the client requesting. And in this case, it models back to like, someone announcing something and delivering it to the clients, which we call events. And this is how we think about it in Socket.io. But I, I'd like to make the distinction that it's technically still not required that you do push to satisfy the two conditions that we set. So one of the ways that people have circumvented this, if you reduce proximity from the client or the server, so you minimize the latency, um, then, in this case, by having the waiter right next to the guy, then you might think that your application is real time just because the latency of the request response cycle is so low that to the end user, it's real time. And the other thing that you have to do to make this work is you have to increase server capacity. So it would be equivalent to having tons of capacity just because you're expecting so much more load. So if you do these two things, you do effectively have a real-time application. And then that like naive example that I set up would actually work really well. So 
what I, what I want to point to with this is that real time is more about the user experience. It's not so much about what stack you decide on or, or what transports you're using. So um, there is two implications that I've thought of that come with setting up an application that, that is both fast and self-updating. So as far as making your application fast, the speed at which you basically make the data transfer work is going to determine how real-time your application is. And I've come to understand that real-time is more of a gradient uh, rather than a binary classification. Uh, and an example that I remember from like many years ago when I was just getting started with Socket.io was Google Docs. Uh, there was a little startup here in San Francisco called Etherpad that defined themselves as really real time. So this, is what, this was their way of saying that even though there were real time systems available like Google Docs, they were sort of pointing to them standing alone in that regard. Um, and also they were pointing to how like Google was taking an arbitrary length of time as opposed to being as immediate as it could be. So this kind of points to that first naive example that we're doing. And they, point, they give a great example of how uh, most of the communication that we do uh, in real life doesn't really have this uh, sort of arbitrary latency. So at the time, I think Google satisfied the self-updating thing, uh, but didn't, it wasn't as fast as it could be. So someone came up, a little startup in this case, and made something better, got acquired, boom, now they're in some beach in Hawaii. Uh, <laughs> no, they're probably just working here. They're probably maybe here. <laughs> Friday night, thinking about real time. Yeah, so uh, one of the things they did was uh, they switched from uh, an algorithm of how they converge changes in the text. And I I'm not sure about this one, but I think they were just polling and they implemented long polling. So they, they focused on making the user experience better. Um, and the other part of uh, the other implication that comes with um, these two conditions for real time applications is that. If you're going to make your application self-updating, it can't just be self-updating while the network is working perfectly or during the beginning of the session. And you have to make it work all along. And reconnection is one of the things that you have to do. So uh, you're setting up an expectation, which is for the user, the data is always up to date and coming in. And they're not going to be used to like thinking that they need to press a refresh button. So one of the consequences is that you have to make sure that the user knows what this, what, that if there is a network problem or if they're disconnected, that you're trying to reconnect. And of course, most of the real-time applications that you use today, like uh, Google Chat or Facebook Messenger, do a good, uh, good job at doing this. But another thing that is really important to consider is what I call state reconciliation, or uh, we could call it uh, resynchronization. Uh, and a test that I run on most applications is, and especially the ones that are self-updating is, what happens if I'm looking at something that's updating in real time, I close my laptop lid, and I come back to it a week later. I just open it, and what happens to that session? And it turns out that the front end needs to keep uh, a few things in mind that maybe uh, we're not used to thinking about. One of them is that the session could have expired, uh, so the application needs to know how to re-render itself in a logged out state, for example, dynamically. Um, user login change. So there's a, a chance that maybe from another tab or you invalidated the session remotely, so you actually have to repaint the screen with, with a completely different user. Or uh, more concerningly, uh, you might have been offline for so long that the delta is really big. And in many cases, it's not even worth showing entirely. So there's a lot of systems that, ma that make your application satisfy the condition of being self-updating by ensuring that they synchronize every change that happens over time to any data that the user is looking at. But then they're going to hit a problem when you're offline for a very long time because of two reasons. One is you might overwhelm the user with data. But even if the user can handle it, it might not even be relevant. So if you're offline looking at a Twitter stream or a Facebook stream for a very long period of time, by the time I know a week has passed, it doesn't even make sense to get the entire diff. You might, you might just want to get the tail and also handle it appropriately on the, on the, on the front end. So uh, the conclusion is also that you have to be careful with uh, designing it around an event log of sorts where uh, if, you're ch if you're the user is subscribing to some data, 
your front end assumes that every single, every subsequent change without fault is going to be retrieved. Um, and finally, I'd like to mention uh, an important caveat um, that comes with uh, basically designing this type of application. Or I should say, at this time, it's sort of a risk that uh, a lot of us uh, run into. So I think in the effort to making our web applications feel alive and self-updating, because it's so rewarding to the user and sometimes so rewarding to the developer, we've forgotten that we're actually maybe making it fast during the, run, uh, the, the lifetime of the session. But in the beginning, when we were lo loading our web application, it's actually really, really slow. So a term that I object to as of today, because it dawned on me today that single page app is a really bad name for what we want to do. Because in some cases, it implies that we're giving up server rendering. So there's only one page, which means your server handles every URL the same way, which is not good. And, and we're going to see why. In most cases, this type of application incurs in too many hops in the network to uh, give the user the data he wants. And in many cases, they also give up the information that they have of the URL. If the user comes to you with a certain URL, you already can prepare the data that he wants to. You don't have to download a huge single page application script, then evaluate it, then get the data. So, uh, and I think uh, this happens a lot because there's a lot of progress being made in the frameworks that we use. So React.js, Socket.io, all these frameworks are really exciting, but we're forgetting about basically how that first request works. So a useful reminder is that we're all operating under the assumption that TCP is how we establish that first connection to the server, and that's how we get the data. Google is working on making improvements to uh, TCP and uh, coupling it uh, in such a way that it works better for speedy connections. But for the moment, we have TCP as the foundation of everything we do in uh, real-time web applications. Uh, the data is sent in segments uh, over a sliding window that acts as a congestion control mechanism. And we have to keep in mind that data is, is uh, sent to the user in a growing way. So initially, it just is only able to send four segments. And I like always stealing this slide from Paul Irish uh, that points to how much data the client is able to absorb over time for every TCP connection. And then he has really interesting numbers for the equivalent in 3G connections. And it kind of shows, uh, it kind of puts into perspective how bad it is to make the user load all these huge uh, single page applications. The conclusion is that the first 14 kilobytes are the most important to make the application feel really fast in that initial load time. So my conclusion is that the most optimal real-time application will have to necessarily render data on the server, or at the very least, render a placeholder of where you're going to fill in the data. So part of it, or completely, you have to render data on the server, and it's not a choice. So I think when um, I was asked to talk about the future of real-time applications, I think most of the future will have to do with investment in making this faster, because we've made the lifetime of the application fast. Like once everything is loaded, everything is super fast and self-updating, but that initial uh, connection is actually pretty slow. It's very important that the client side then takes over when, once that initial server render happens, because if our goal is to minimize latency and make the application really fast, JavaScript is uniquely positioned to do that because we can even mask the actual network latency by using JavaScript in the client to make the front end behave optimistically. And a, an example that I always mention is you, you write a chat application, and it doesn't matter how optimized it is. It doesn't matter that you use the transport with the lowest amount of framing, like WebSocket. At the end of the day, most applications will actually insert or repaint the screen once you hold down your Enter key, because that's the best user experience. They're not just waiting for the network. So basically, we do need this basically initial really fast server load, in many cases with server rendering data. And then we have to have the client take over, because otherwise we're giving up on these really amazing optimizations and opportunities to mask latency. So even if the network is terrible, uh, clients like JavaScript will always make it better. 
So the, the consequence that I was mentioning earlier, or the implication that we have to be really mindful of reconciliation and reconnection is even more important in this case, because you have to think of the server rendering some data as basically a connection that disconnects immediately, then the data gets transferred to the client, then the JavaScript loads or whatever, and the connection gets uh, started up again. And then at that point, there is a chance that from the moment that the server under the page, data could have changed. That's why you have to always think of uh, these self-updating applications through the lens of the worst case scenario, that, which is there's a lot of disconnections and reconnections. And to make this seamless, I, and I think this is uh, sort of the conclusion, is the ability to share code is going to be uniquely important. Um, so the, the future is what it's always been about, I think, it's, which is make your data, make your app deliver data faster. And uh, I think running JavaScript on the server with Node.js is going to be really helpful for that. Thank you.